Now today, we're going to continue on in our series. Um, our series is God's Goodness, Living in the Goodness of God. We've been in the series for about seven or so weeks now. Uh, we only have two weeks left of this series, and we're finishing off the entire chapter of Psalm chapter 23. And in Psalm 23, we're, we're learning about how God is good, that, that it's, it's not just God being good during the good moments in our life, because it's, it's easy for us to admit, hey, God is good when there's a lot of money in the bank. Uh, God is good when our relationships are going well. God is good when, when our health is going well. So, but oftentimes, there, there's this, this, this uh, thought in our mind or this doubt in our mind when we're going through the valleys. And that's what this verse is about, is that as you go through the valley of the shadow of death, as you go through dark moments in your life, That God is still good. God's character isn't defined by the circumstance or situation. But how awesome is this that we have a God that isn't just there with us during the good moments of our life, but he says, I'm going to walk with you during the tough moments. I'm going to direct you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to protect you as you go through these different, the difficult moments uh, in your life. So again, that's what we're learning today. And so let's go ahead and look at uh, Psalm chapter 23. We're going to look all the way through verse 5. So again, there's only six verses, so we're just about done with the chapter. It says this. A Psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. For even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And we talked, all those, the, the white text is all what we've already covered up to this point. And again, all those are on our, on our YouTube channel, so you can go back and look at those. But we're going to cover today the yellow text. You have anointed my head with oil. So based on this text, we're going to understand what it means to be anointed by God. So today's message is called anointed, that we are chosen for a purpose. See, to become, to be anointed literally means that you are chosen. So we're going to talk about what that means today. But before we get started with that, would you please pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we get a chance, Father, to step back and to remember that... uh, even through the dark moments, you're right there for us. Today, we're gonna gonna show what it means to be anointed by you, what it means to be chosen by you. Father, that just because we go through tough times doesn't mean that we've lost the the battle. But Father, you're right there with us. Today, we're gonna see the benefits of what that means. And because of that, Father, help us to keep moving forward and to see your blessing in our life. We thank you so much and we love you with all of our heart. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So again, if you wanna take out your notes out of your program, again, today's message is called Anointed. We are chosen for a purpose. Now, uh, the word anointed, we don't use it often in, in Western civilization, right? So in the United States, we don't use that term anointed. We don't really talk about uh, what, it, what, what anointment is. And, uh, and during this time in the Bible, what they would do is they would anoint uh, with oil. It was just olive oil. That's what they would do. And so they would actually pour it on people's head, and then they would pray a ble- blessing on them. Now, uh, today, if I was to do that today, like let's say if you invited me to come over to your house and you said, hey, um, you know, we're going to have you over for, for a barbecue and I get there, I'm like, awesome. And then you set the table and then I, you know, we have, a, we have food, we have salad and then there's, there's, a, there's some oil there that I can put on the salad. Instead of pouring it on my salad, I get up and I pour it on your head and I start kind of rubbing it in in your head. Yeah, you're probably not going to invite me back again, right? You're going to be like, get out of here, weirdo. What are you doing? You know, so, so, so we don't see, you know, this happening uh, in today uh, very often. We do see it actually um, anointing with oil uh, for kings in other, in other areas of the world, they actually still do that uh, today. But, the, but the, there's the, the, the symbolism behind this is huge. So here's what it was. In the Bible, you see that there are two ways to become anointed by God. The first one is directly by God, and that was done through the Holy Spirit. If you look at it, the Bible talks about that you are anointed by God through the Holy Spirit. God never did a physical anointing himself. It wasn't like all of a sudden, he's like, I'm, I'm going to choose you for a purpose, and I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and anoint you, and it starts raining oil on you, okay? So God never did that, all right? And so so when you're anointed by God, God says that when we give our life to him, that God's Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. And then um, the other way of anointing in the Bible was through people. God used people to go and do an anointment. Now, there was, uh, olive oil was used in many different ways in Scripture. I'm not going to go through all the different ways about, you know, when people would pray over people when they're, you know, to, for healing and so forth. But there was a specific one that God would use uh, for, and this is the one we're seeing here today, is that God would use people to go and anoint someone else. And then, and then what that meant was actually that they were being set apart for something bigger. To, uh, to be anointed literally means that you are set apart that you, that for a greater purpose. So what they would do is they would actually, a prophet would go and, and speak to someone and they would anoint them and say, hey, now you know this, that you are by God set apart for a greater purpose. That's why King David, when he says, you've anointed my head with oil, when he was a young boy, Samuel went over to him, anointed him, said, God said, you're going to be the next king. 
And so he's like, you're going to have a bigger purpose for your life. And so that, that's, what it, that's what it meant. So uh, the, really, the oil wasn't really anything special either. People have asked, is it holy oil? No, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as holy oil. So it was literally olive oil. See, the, 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 it, the significance wasn't in the material. The significance is in what it represented. And we see this through scripture in many different ways. That if you look at the material, you kind of go, well, there's nothing special about the material. But when you're using it in that context, it changes everything. For example, communion. You know, when we take communion, uh, that's a huge thing the Bible says that we're supposed to do as Christians. That when we go in our life to Jesus, that communion is so important. But if you look at the elements of communion, it's a cracker and grape juice. That's really what it is. Unleavened bread, which is bread that has not been risen. And so people have gotten fancy. They make different shapes and all that. But, but really, think about it. It's, it's cracker and grape juice. That is the actual material used for that. I got to tell you, at home, I love grape juice. I love it. Uh, I love saltine crackers. I really do. I love them. But here's the thing. When I'm eating it at home, the, the significance isn't there. But when the Bible says you come together and you do this with this in mind, it changes everything. When we do it in communion, that juice and that cracker represent the blood and the body of Christ. That it's a reminder for us of the sacrifice that he's willing to do for us, what he was willing to give up so that we can have a relationship with God through him. You see, the elements are just normal things, but, but it represents something significant in that situation. The same thing is true with baptism. I mean, think about this. Uh, there's no holy water. Like when people get baptized, I, I, I've baptized people in crazy places. Really, uh, I've baptized people in, in a lake. And, and you know what the lake is, really? You know why you can't see the bottom? It's a fish toilet. That's what it kind of comes down to, you know? I, and I've baptized people. I said, be clean in this dirty water, right? And, and so, I mean, I've baptized people in the lake. I've baptized people in, um, in their hot tub, uh, in, in, uh, in their bathtubs, in our bathtubs, uh, in pools. Uh, our baptuzi that's out there, the baptuzi is nothing more than a one-person hot tub. We call it the baptuzi. That, that's what it is. The water that's in there is water from the hose. I know some of you are going, wait a second, wait a second. But when I got baptized, I felt tingling. Well, you know what that was? We put a little too much chlorine that day. You're, that, you lost a little bit of skin. You know? I mean, no. no, but I want you to see this. I want you to see. It really is. It's normal water and a container for the water. But when you do it, the Bible says that in Romans chapter 6, when you do it, for baptism, for commitment to God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 that the same way that Jesus was buried into the tomb the night that he was crucified, that a part of him died, the physical part, says that that for us, when we go down in the water, it represents that, that the old self is dead, it's gone. And then it says that Jesus Christ rose on the third day and he rose to live a new life in spirit. He says that when we come out of that water, Romans 6 says that you come out to live a brand new life, that it is a commitment, that is your wedding day with God. You're saying, God, I'm all in. That's why you go all in, you come back up, is that you're saying, God, this changes everything. 1 Peter chapter 3, it says there that baptism is not a washing of the outside of dirt, but it's actually a plea with God for a clear conscience. That we say, God, I accept the sacrifice of Jesus to wipe me clean from the inside out. See, in that situation, it represents so much more. Same thing is true with like a wedding ring, which is so funny. On the way here, I was going through my message. I was driving and and I'm going through all my points in my head. And as I was driving, I was like, yeah, you know, in in our wedding ring and uh, what that symbolizes. And I was like, yeah, you know, so for example, and I went, (gasps) I forgot my wedding ring at home. Sorry, but there it is. Want to bring it to me, baby? There it is. (laughs) This was hilarious. First service? Yeah, thank you, baby. <laughs> That's my wife. Yeah. It was so funny. First service, here's what I said. I went, oh, I forgot it. And I'm like, oh, my wife's going to go, mm-hmm. And I was like, she usually brings it to me. I'm like, hey, she brought it to you. That's so awesome. And so, um, but here's the thing, is that the wedding ring, right? Right now, I'm married. I'm proud to be married. Do you know that this is not my original wedding ring? The wedding ring that I got? You know, at, um, at my wedding for my wife, I lost it. Like, was it 12 years ago or so? I think it was my son that did it. He says it was me, but I don't know. Because I, I was at a softball game. I used to be at the sports park, right? I used to play softball out there. And he, he asked me for money to go get, like, nachos or something. And he, he unzipped it. And I, I believe that's when it fell out. He's like, Dad, it was you. And I'm like, okay. But, but I do have to say this. Even if that one wasn't it, uh, I have actually lost my wedding rings before. So this is not my second one either. You know, I, I, had, I had another one too. And so this wedding ring, I got to tell you, because, because I'm, I, I don't know what's wrong with me, 
that this is, I just went into Walmart and got this wedding ring. Because I'm like, if I lose it, I don't want to lose a huge investment anymore. My wife's like, let's get you a good one. I'm like, no, this is good because you know me, right? And so, um, but here's the thing. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. I'm married. It's no longer on my finger. Am I still married? Yes. Yes. See, the wedding ring represents a commitment, right? It's just a piece of metal. But the reality is I'm married to my wife. It's a, it's a representation of our relationship. And so the same thing is true when it comes to anointing with oil in, in, in the Bible. What they did is it, it wasn't the significance of the material. Well, the significance was this, is in, in what it represented during that time. And so what it represented was this. It represents God's presence, God's protection, God's promise, and God's uh, uh, prosperity. That's what it represents. It represents that God has chosen you for something significant. God is going to empower you to do something big in your life. Now, when you think about that, I'm going, wait a second. If that's the case, that's what it represents. Where's all the oil, right? You're on the way out. You're like, can you just slap some oil on my head on the way out? I mean, because if it represents prosperity, promise that God is there for us. See, the reason we don't have to do that today anymore is this. It's because everything changed when Jesus came. See, if you go back and you look at the word, uh, at, at Jesus, first of all, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't know what Christ means. See, people look at Jesus Christ and they go, oh, Jesus Christ. It's Jesus and Christ is his last name. It's actually, Christ is not his last name. It's actually Jesus the Christ. And the word Christ it, in the Greek literally means the anointed one. The one that has been chosen, that's been set apart for a bigger purpose. The same, that's the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the word Messiah it's the same word. It's just in the Hebrew. The word Messiah means the anointed one, the one that was set aside for a greater purpose. You see, so Christ is the anointed one. Christ is the one that was set aside for a greater purpose. And when we are followers of Jesus, we are called Christians. We bear the name of Christ. It means that we are set apart for a greater purpose. Listen to what it says here. I love this verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says this. For we are his workmanship, his poema, his work of art, created in Christ Jesus. In who? In Christ Jesus. There it is. See, we are in Christ Jesus, created for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. It says that when we are in Christ, that God has set us aside, set us apart from everything else to do a greater thing. This is what's often referred to in, in churches as, um, as your calling. Your calling. Uh, to be called by God, the actual... Um, a Greek word for that is the word kaleo, kaleo, which means to be called and set, set apart for something significant. Now, here's the issue that happens, is that when we are called and we're living out God's purpose for our life, that's really what gives us satisfaction, gives us fulfillment, gives us joy. I mean, when, God, when we are living out, as I said there, that God prepared this beforehand, when we are living out what God intended for our life, it changes everything. And when we are not living in God's purpose for our life, we end up unfulfilled, unsatisfied, and unhappy. So today we're going to talk about the benefit, the benefits of living out God's purpose for our life. Because every single one of us in Christ, we were called, we were set apart to do something greater. So we're going to look at those benefits. And we know what I love about this is this, is that King David, when he's saying this in Psalm 23, he's like, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. He's talking about, he's going through a tough time. And in that, he says this, as he's talking about God's goodness through tough times, he says, and God, you have anointed my head with oil. God, you have set me apart. God, you have a greater purpose. I want you to know, he's not reminding God of that. It wasn't like, he, like God went, I did? No, he was. He was reminding himself. I think part of that is this, is there are times in our life when let's admit that God has set us aside and God has us on this journey and we're living out God's purpose and then we hit a valley. And oftentimes the, the natural thing that happens to us is we start to question that. Is this really God's purpose? Is God really gonna use me in this way? Do I have the, the ability to do it this way? See, in this moment, King David was questioning his own ability and he's reminding himself, Wait a minute, my calling is by God, not by myself. So God will give me what I need to accomplish his purpose. The same thing is true with every one of us. So let's look at the benefits there. The first thing is this, God gives us abilities. 
God gives us abilities. One thing I love about God is that God will never ask us to do something that he has not equipped us to do, right? That he equips us. Now, this doesn't mean you're naturally equipped. But when, when we give our life to God, God, the Bible tells us God's Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. And God's Holy Spirit is to help us, to enable us, to direct us, and to equip us to do things that we naturally would not do. It's known as, as the, the fruit of the Spirit, spiritual gifts. You see this through Scripture. That God, it says that God does something in you, and, and he prepares you for something greater. He, he makes it sure that you're ready when the thing happens. And we're not ready in our own ability, but in his game plan. Uh, the other day, I was watching um, uh, TV with Gabe, and as we were watching, we were watching uh, bloopers, and it was football bloopers. And I got to tell you, I was laughing so hard to see some of these bloopers. I'm like, oh, man, what was that? And, and actually, on one of the bloopers, they said that the, um, they said, yeah, the coach completely messed that one up. You can see that everyone was confused. They, they didn't know what to do. They might have practiced it one time, and that was it. And then they call them and say, do it now in the game with the pressure of the game, you know, at hand. They couldn't do it, and they said they weren't well prepared. And so, and I got to tell you, and then it made me laugh, you know, but, but then I stepped back and went, you know what? One thing we know about God is that God always equips us and prepares us for something. He'll stretch us. He'll stretch you beyond your ability, but through his power in our life, he'll, he'll, get, he'll give us more ability. This is what it says here in 1 Thessalonians 5.24. It says this, the one who calls you, see again, that's the word call, which, which means kaleo, the one who has set you apart, called you out. Is faithful. God is faithful and he will do it. Not you will do it on your own. God will see it through. He'll give you new abilities, new insights. And the, when this starts, people have asked me, how do you know? Like, how do you know? Here's how, it, how you know. When you give your life to God, God says he gives you his Holy Spirit. And at that point, uh, you're going to start living in the Spirit. And, and God, you'll start seeing these other things manifesting in your life. But here's the thing. You'll see it even more when you start doing something with it. I've seen people that God has gifted in incredible ways and they're on the sidelines when they should be in the game. When they should jump right in and start using the gifts that God has given them. But instead they're going, you know, I'm, I, I just don't know if I'm ready. I don't know. And God's going, are you kidding me? I am calling you out to be a part of this. This is why that shape, the you know, step three of our next steps shows you how God has shaped you and given you the abilities to do this. And, and there will be abilities that you will receive that you don't have naturally. Uh, a great instance of this is with the disciples. See, Jesus, when he called his disciples, you know the disciples were just fishermen and tax collector. I mean, really, they were normal people. It wasn't, it wasn't that Jesus didn't go into the synagogue and call out the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, all the religious rulers. He didn't go, hey, I'm gonna do something great with you guys. No, it says that he was walking along the sea. He looks over and he sees these guys fishing and he says, hey, come with me. I'm gonna make you now fishers of men. You're gonna change the world. Now, these are people that you go, they don't have the ability they didn't have the education to do this. This is crazy. And then Jesus gives them an amazing task in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he talks about the day of Pentecost that's going to be coming up in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, listen to what he says here. He says, but you, talking to his disciples, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. He says, you guys, you fishermen. You tax collector, you broken people, here's what you're going to do. I have a purpose. I have set you aside for a greater purpose. And you're going to go and you're going to proclaim the good news in, in, in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea. He's like, you're going to, it's going to spread out and to the outer parts of the world that my message is going to start with you. And it's going to spread. Let me tell you something. This here was an impossible situation. It was impossible. First of all, they were just normal people. But secondly, there was no planes, trains, or automobiles. There was no ships that can cross from that area, the Middle East, and go over to Australia at that time or go over to the U.S. at that time. They didn't have those. They had fishing boats. Remember, they were fishermen. They weren't sea fishermen. I mean, they were in the Sea of Galilee, but that was just a big old giant lake. They just had fishing boats. And Jesus says, you guys are going to do this. You're going to have the ability. And then you see it, something happen. After the day of Pentecost, it says, when when the Holy Spirit comes on them, it says that at that point, they went from being cowardice. The, you know, Peter is the one that denied Jesus three times the day Jesus was crucified. To now after this, he was bold and was able to stand up and had answers for the biggest religious people of that time. He didn't have it before. God gives us those abilities. He makes the impossible possible. Let me tell you another impossible situation just in today. Me. 
I can't believe I get to do this. I can't believe I can do this. When I was in college, when I graduated college back in 96, I just aged myself a little bit. You know, but, but when I was in college, I had, I had to do a public speaking part of, my, of a presentation, and this was a big classroom, and I still remember this. You know, the professor said, you're going to go up and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do your presentation to the class. And I'm like, all right. I got up there, and I almost threw up on the professor and the students. I was like, I was sick to my stomach. I was shaky. I was like, I'll, I seriously said, I'll never speak in public again. And then, and then I got into ministry. And, and after I was ordained in ministry, after three years, and I remember I, I started helping out in, in other classrooms and teaching like the little kids, and they started teaching the youth. And then I remember one day they asked me, they said, hey, uh, would you want to teach the, uh, the adults on a Wednesday night? We have a big Bible study. I want you to teach it. And I'm like, uh, okay. I didn't want to do it. But I didn't want to say no either to the people, you know. So, so I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. I kid you not. I got up on the stage. I turned around, and I was like, oh, I'm, I was going to pass out right there. I got tunnel vision, started sweating. It was the craziest thing. And then I ended up finding a friend in the audience. And I was like, okay, there they are. And I was like, okay, okay, cool. And at that point, I remember just freaking out going, I don't want to do that again. I was like, no way. And I have this thing called anxiety. I have clinical anxiety. And... Uh, I shouldn't be allowed to do this. I, shouldn't, I don't have the ability to do this. But when I gave my life to God, I started following his purpose. I now can see that the, everywhere that God had taken me to refine me, to get me to the point where I can be up here and be an impact. You see, that's what happens when you, when you rely. If, if I was relying on my power, I wouldn't be up here today. But when I said, you know what, God, if this is where you want me, I'm going to serve you with everything I've got. I talk to other pastors that think about that all the time. That they tell me, they're like, I can't believe we get to do this. I'm like, I know. Can you believe we get to do this? Our leaders here in the church are some of the most humble, incredible people. They're, they're like, uh, you know, can you believe we get to impact people for God? I mean, and we, a lot of times we go, we're not qualified, but it's great because God qualifies us, right? And so God gives us the, the ability to go and to serve and to make a difference. And that's the thing. See, we are limited, but God is not. But God is not. You know, remember I told you about King Saul and how, you know, King David was the king that took, that took over after King Saul. And King Saul, um, he was limited. When we first start hearing about him, when God was anointing him, when God was setting him aside for something greater, he didn't want to do it. King Saul was, was uh, very insecure. He, he didn't believe in his own ability. He's like, look, there's no way that I can do this. And, and then the prophet goes and tells him, look, God has said it's you. You know, for a time, you're going to be the king. And then, you know, he was, then God was going to prepare David. But he's like, for the time, you're going to be the king. And so, so God gives them an incredible ability. Listen to what it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6. In verse 1, he says, God chose you. Saul then says, I can't be me. And by the time um, it's done, here's what, here's what the prophet told him. At that time, the spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you. And you will prophesy. Prophesy just means you speak God's truth with them. And you will be changed into a different person. After these signs take place, do what must be done, for God is with you. He said, don't be afraid. This is not about you. When God's spirit comes on you, when God is in your life, when God has called you into this purpose, God will give you the, what you need. He says, do what must be done and know that God is the one that will bring that success. And it's said that God's going to change you. He's going to change them. That's what God does. He changes us. He went from being a wimp, insecure guy to being confident. And unfortunately, later on, when he became insecure again, he lost his position as king. That's when David, King David, stepped in and became king. See, because he lost track and focus on God. But when our focus is on God and God's purpose, he gives us what we need, the, the ability. That's number one. The number two is this. God also gives us power. God gives us power. Now, let's admit, I know for me this is true, I believe that more power makes things easier, right? Like, like, for example, let's say that you had to move a bunch of dirt, a mountain of dirt that's the size of this auditorium, all the way top, to, you know, all the way from here, it's filled, it's just a big mount of dirt, and you had to move it. And if you went in there with, one, with your shovel and with a Ford F-150 truck, um, it's going to take you a while, right? You're going to start. You know, it might be that after, after a few truckloads, you're like, you know what? I can't do this. There's no way. This is too much. Well, you end up quitting. You might put a little dent in it, and that's pretty much it. But if, if we said you had to move this whole dirt, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you some tools. One of the tools is a giant tractor that's going to grab this stuff, and, and it's going to dump these big old mounds of dirt into this truck right here from a mine. The mine's going to let you borrow it. 
Now that there is one serious truck. I actually got to see one of those in person when we did a field trip with our kids um, over to the mine. And so those things are massive. See, now if you go, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. I've got a tractor and I've got that truck. You're like, yeah, that mountain's nothing. That's nothing. They're, yeah, the, why? Because they have more power. It's easier and quicker to get things done. Exactly. See, if we try to face the mountain of the purpose, the big purpose that God has for our life, that's like taking a shovel and a Ford F-150 and trying to dig in. But God says, it was never intended for you to do it on your own. If it's God's purpose for our life, we've got to stay connected to God. God says, I've got the tractor. I've got the truck. We're going to get this thing done. And let my power be in you. See, there's the difference. The difference between somebody fulfilling God's purpose connected to God and, 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 um, and not connected to God is what power are we tapping into? Listen to what it says here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, God's glorious riches, the word glorious riches literally means unlimited resources. So out of God's unlimited resources that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in the inner being. That God gives us the power, gives us the ability. See, we are all limited, but God is not. He is unlimited. See, our, our wisdom is limited. Our talent is limited. Our knowledge is li limited. Our strength is limited. I, I remember back when I was younger, I used to think, my strength isn't limited. I mean, I, I, I'm healthy. I'm as strong as an ox. And, uh, and then you kind of get some age in your years, right? And now I go, oh, man, I got bad knees. I got a bad back, my back hip. I got my ankle hurts. You know, and then I, now I go, oh, man, yeah, maybe I wasn't made out of metal like I thought back in the day, right? And, and now, now I, I go, I, maybe I shouldn't have done all that crazy stuff, the sports and all the crazy stuff. I should have just been typing the whole time. Right? So kind of, kind of prolong the pain, right, or prolong not getting the pain. And so, but here's the thing. We are all limited, but God is not. Now, how do you know if you're tapping into God during fulfilling your purpose? Here's how. That when you're fulfilling your purpose, are you tired and do you feel like giving up and saying, I don't have what it takes? Because at that point, your focus is on your ability. And God says, if it's his purpose, it's not based on our ability. But when we stay strong, we say, God, I know you're going to get me through. I know you're going to help through this. And God starts putting resources and things into your life. That changes everything. He gives us the ability to do it all. He does if it's his purpose. Listen to what it says here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. It says this. It says, I can do all things. What things? All things through him who strengthens me. Now, I want you to understand this verse is so powerful. Because in this verse, the apostle Paul, he's writing this out of prison. Out of prison. And the reason he was in prison was because he told people about Jesus. They didn't want to hear it, so they tossed him into prison. He was beaten and thrown into prison. And while he's there, he doesn't know if he's going to get out. Like literally, he himself physically is powerless to his situation. He, he could not come up with a cunning statement to get him out. He could not, in his own power, get out of the situation. So then he goes on, he says, you know what? Here's what I've learned. I've learned that in Christ, I can be content, Philippians 4, 11. I can be content in any and every situation. For I've known to be hungry and I've known to be full. For I've known to, be, to, to have plenty and to be in need. And he says, and I can be content in everything. Let's admit, that's a pretty impossible situation because we live in a society that when you have everything, it's easy to be content. But what about when you have nothing? He says, I can do the impossible through Christ who gives me strength, that God is going to get me through. You see, it's not based on our endurance or our adrenaline. Why? Because that's going to run out. Too often we replace that. As a society, we replace, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oftentimes we say, I can do all things through, and we put a different word in there as a society. I can do all, all things through my team. As long as I have a good, good amount of people around me, we can do all things. No, you can do some things. And maybe you can do some things well, but you can't do all things. You know why? Because they get tired too, and people will let you down. Sometimes people say, I can do all things through my bank account because I have a lot of money. That can disappear just like that. I'm telling you. Stock, stock market drops. Things, you know, things happen all the time. Just like that, it could be gone. You know, sometimes people saying, you know, I can do all things through my own ability. I and mean, that's what those people that are arrogant, that they believe, hey, I, I'm so good that I can get this done. 
Listen, at some point, your body will start to fail you. So we need to understand that it's through Christ and Christ alone. And there's no, no one other than God that can meet your emotional need, your physical need, and your spiritual need all together. See, and it is then that you can do all things. It is then that you can have contentment because you know that God's power is there, is helping you through. Let me tell you, last month, I've told you, last month was nuts for our family. It's been crazy. I mean, and I'm talking about not just, you know, we had my son in the hospital. We had thing after thing after thing after thing. I'm like, this was crazy. And I'll be honest with you, my knees buckled a couple times. I wish I could tell you that the whole time I'm going, we're strong. I got this. I got this. You know what? Here's what I, I said. I can tell you how many times I said this. I don't got this, God. This is beyond my ability. This is beyond my power. I mean, right now, there, there, there's nothing I can do in that situation. I'm doing my best. That's all I can do. And then I turn around and said, but God, I know you're going to use this for a greater purpose. We're going to be strong, but we're not strong in ourselves. We're strong in you. And God continue to help us through that situation. But that all happens when we rely on Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I love this verse here also in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. I love this. Listen to what it says. It says, now to him, now to God, to Christ, who, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. You, you notice what it said there. It says that God is able to do far more beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that has worked within us through us. Through it, that if we're fulfilling God's purpose for our life, that he will do more than we could dream. Now, I have to tell you, I'm a big dreamer. I have never been accused of dreaming small. You can ask our staff here. You can ask the, all, all of our leaders and directors in the church. There are times when we'll sit down in our meetings, and I'm like, hey, boom, and I tell them my dream. And I can see, just see their eyes going, hmm? I'm like, okay, they're stressed out a little bit. Okay. And so I'm telling you, I have never been accused of dreaming small. But this says here that if we're fulfilling God's purpose, that even your biggest dreams are small because God's going to do something even greater through it. I got to tell you, I could have never imagined being in a church with three, three services. I'm like, this is incredible. I would just say, you know what, God, I just want to impact people. That's all I want to do. I want to change lives. I want to show them that your love and what your love means and the significance of that. And God just keeps blowing our mind. Every, every time we set a goal, God goes, oh, that's, is that all? And I'm going, that's big. Boom, something else happens. I mean, that's how incredible God is. He can do far more. But it all starts with living out his purpose. Now, I want to talk about when God blesses us, right? So when, when we talk about God blessing our life, God anointing us, which means being set apart, created for a bigger purpose, there's a mistake that's always done. Is oftentimes we believe that when God starts to bless our life and we're living for a bigger purpose, that the purpose is now us. But I want you to know, this is the last part there in your notes, that God's blesses, uh, God blesses us to bless others. This is huge. This is something that we cannot forget. That it can't just be about God. Thank you for setting me aside uh, and, and, and blessing my life. And, and we become, we look at God kind of like the sugar daddy in the sky. That he's just there doing everything for us. Because let me tell you, as you're living your purpose, God will give you the resources. I need you to know that. He will. He, you, there will be times when you're doing something and you're like, this is going to take a miracle. And then you go, oh, there it is. It's It's incredible. So God will do this. God will, if you're living out your purpose, maybe it's a financial resource, maybe it's a talent, an ability. God will use all those different things, opportunities, network. You know, when you know a lot of people, God will use all of those things for his greater purpose. King David, for example, when he was anointed by God, by King Samuel, or I'm sorry, by, by Samuel the prophet, he, he then became king. Now, King David, when he became king, he wasn't just like, hey, bring me some grapes fix my nails. He didn't do that. If you read about King David's life, you see he went battle after battle after battle after battle. You know why he did battle after battle? He was there to protect God's people, to lead God's people. It was never about himself. It was about the people. That's so, that's so important for all of us. Now, here's the beauty of it, though. Did King David get blessed as, as he was being a blessing to others? Yes, he was king. He was hooked up. God, I mean, he literally, I mean, he had everything he possibly needed. See, here's the thing. You cannot give to someone something that you don't have. 
If you don't have the blessing in your life, you can't do that for other people. For example, if I told you after service today, I'm going to give you $1 million, you would be happy. It's false happiness. I don't got it. You see, I don't have it. And if I don't have it, I can't give it to you. But let's say Bill Gates said, hey, I'm going to give you a million dollars. There's a higher chance that he's going to give it to you than me because there's zero chance for me. Right? And so here's the thing is that you have to have the ability in order for that to be a blessing to someone else. So as God blesses you, uh, them through you, you are getting blessed. You're being blessed financially so you can help someone else financially. You know that the reason we give at church is not to meet a budget. It's because as God blesses us, we're saying we're going to be a blessing to other people. We want to bring people to Christ and we're going to invest in the thing that is, that is the purpose, that the one thing that Jesus said that even the gates of hell cannot overcome. You know what that is? The church, the people. We're going to invest in impacting others. See, that's what that means. As God gives you a, a network of people all around you in your jobs, don't just go there and go, cool, we're getting a job done. God is saying, I gave you those people in your life because that person needs Jesus and that person needs Jesus. And you, there's going to be opportunities. Look for those opportunities to impact them. God wants that for us. It's a responsibility. You know that? That as we live out his purpose, it's a responsibility that we have. And I've had people tell me, well, can you lose the anointing of God? Could you lose living out your purpose that God intended for you? The answer to that is yes. Yes. I, when I went back and I started studying this, I'm like, oh my goodness, you can lose it. King Saul, for example. King Saul, God anointed him. He was insecure. God gave him abilities. But when David steps into the picture, this young boy goes on and takes down this giant. King Saul stopped relying on God and started relying on, his, on himself. His just became about him, and he, his heart began to turn. And because of insecurity, he wanted to try to kill uh, David. I mean, it was the craziest thing. And it says there that at one point, God removed his anointment from him and gave it to King David. See, God will say, hey, if you're trying to do this on your own, disconnected from me, and it now becomes all about you, God's purpose is not all about us. It's about, as God blesses us, we are a blessing to others. Listen to what it says here in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2. It says this. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. It says it is our responsibility to care about other people, to tell them that there will be a day that we will have to stand before God and that you don't have to stand judgment. You know that? That through Christ, our sin has been forgiven. We don't have to worry about that, that we can stand with confidence. It says, and you're there to help people, those that are mourning and those that are brokenhearted, those that are hurting, that we're supposed to go and impact those people. You know, we have an incredible missions ministry here at the church, but our church is big. And we have less than 10% of people in our missions ministry. I want us to see us be a church where 100% of the church is on a mission. It's not just a missionary that goes on mission. God says we are all on mission. That we are all asked and, re and required and, and a part of our purpose is to help the broken, to help the needy. To be there with the morning, to pray with them, to, to, to help lift them up and to teach them the good news about Jesus. So I'm hoping that as a church, we all sign up for it. If you want to sign up for our missions ministry on that blue connections card, just sign up and just put missions. Give us your name and your phone number. Because I got to tell you, it's incredible. And you know what's so amazing is that when we go out on mission and impact people, the blessing that God brings on us. When we go out and we're feeding needing families and, and homeless people and we're, and, we're, and, we're, and we're giving them things and we're praying with them and, and you see the smile on their face, I got to tell you, God changes something inside of us. We are all on mission. But here's the thing. Sometimes people think, well, isn't calling a calling just for pastors and ministers and stuff and church leaders? No. You know that God has a purpose for every single one of us and it doesn't just have to be someone who is, is in the pastor or minister role. That God has a plan for every single one of us. And God wants to bless our lives so we can bless, be a blessing to others. Let me, let me end with this story. It was an incredible, incredible story about a, a couple. It's David and Barbara Green. Now, these people uh, started a long time ago um, in their garage. 
uh, building little knickknacks and, you know, doing like Christian art and stuff like that. And so they started kind of selling stuff out of their garage. Now, if you look at, 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 um, at David's life, you would you'd think like something went wrong. He actually, people thought he was the black sheep of the family because his, his dad was a pastor. His dad was a pastor. Uh, his five brothers are all pastors. And then he was like, I don't see that as my calling. I'm not a speaker like that. So uh, I believe God has a different purpose for me, but I will honor God with everything that, that God is going to do in my life. So he started this business out of his garage and selling, and it got bigger and it got bigger. And that business is massive today. You know what's crazy is this, is he made a commitment on that day. He made a commitment. When he started his business, he said, you know what? And at that time, they weren't making very much money. He said, but I, I'm going to vow that however God is going to bless my business, I will give 50% of what comes in of the profit to church or Christian organizations that are making a difference for Jesus. And, you know, so when they were making 50 bucks, you go, okay, there's 25 bucks. This business today is Hobby Lobby. Every time you go to Hobby Lobby, 50% of that goes to a cause for Christ. Whoo, I got goosebumps. They are a multi-billion dollar company they still give 50% of everything that comes in to a cause, the cause for Christ. Now think, of, they've given over a billion dollars. And now, now we look at it going, oh, that's crazy. But why is it crazy? Think about this. When it was 50 bucks and they gave 25, we go, yeah, we could do that. God goes, I'm going to bless that heart. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something incredible. And let's see if they're going to come through. And here they are, multi-billion dollar company. They have given over a billion dollars to organizations to make a difference for Christ. And let me tell you something. We always look at that. Oh, but now they don't have that billion dollars. But you know, guess what they do have? A billion dollars. They have more than they need. God bless them. See, as they're being a blessing to others, are they blessed? Absolutely. That's what happens with a selfless heart. God wants us to impact the world around us. Now, if you're here today and you're saying, well, Pastor Juan, you know, you're here and you're, t you're saying that if, if people are hurting, they're going through a tough time that we should help and that all of us are on mission. Um, absolutely. But maybe you're here today and you're the one that's hurting. Maybe you're here today and you're the one that's going through a tough time and you're like, how can I encourage other, someone else when I'm the one that needs encouraging? That right now I'm going through stuff and I, and I need help and I need, I need God's power in my life. Well, I want to show you something. This is so incredible. So that verse in Isaiah chapter 61, it's not just in Isaiah 61. It's also in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. So because when Jesus did his very first public sermon, his public teaching, right, his very first one, what Jesus did was incredible. He literally got up, opened up the Old Testament, went to this verse, and he read, he read Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. And that, that he was there, anointed by God to, to make a difference, to, to help the, 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 the hurting, right? And that's what Jesus came to do. I mean, that's what he did. So he read it. He then closes the book and sits down. Shortest, it was the shortest teaching ever recorded. You know, I mean, and that's awesome. I mean, I've never had a short one like that. Just go, hey, read a verse. Have a good one. Go home. But, but Jesus then sits down. He sits down. And here's what happens next. In Luke chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, it says this. And he closed the book, so he closed it up. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He says, you guys have been waiting for the one that's going to help. You've been waiting for the one that's going to heal. You've been waiting for the one that's going to empower. You've been waiting for the one that's going to change everything. It happened today. See, so if you're in a part where you're saying, I need a miracle I'm in an impossible situation. Remember this, with God, all things are possible. But it all starts with giving our life to Christ. It all starts there. God, God is there with arms wide open. I want you to know something. God wants something for you. He wants to give you a life of purpose. He wants to, he, you're not here by accident. I want you to know that. That I don't know what brought you in. Maybe you're new today and you came in today. You're like, you, you think, well, maybe it's just because a friend invited me, you know, and they tricked me. They told me there was going to be free breakfast. And yeah, there's free breakfast. Go get it. You know, so if, if you're new today, you get free breakfast. Um, but, but, or, or maybe, you know, you kind of were going by. You thought, hey, this is the old movie theater. Maybe you thought you were going to get a dollar, dollar movie, you know. So I, I don't know, but here's what I want you to know. God knows. And God's calling you to him. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. But it all starts now with you accepting that invitation. 
If you're ready to give your life to Jesus, if you go over to the red connection table back there, the back of the auditorium, we have Pastor Don and Pastor Brent back there. We're going to help you take your next step. Commit your life to God. And remember this, with God, the best is yet to come. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we get to serve you. Father, thank you so much for giving us a bigger purpose than ourselves. But Father, not only do you give us a bigger purpose that makes an, an eternal impact, you also give us the ability and the power when we stay focused on you. I pray, Father, that every single person here understands this, that they have a bigger call, that you, that you want something incredible for them, that whatever they can dream and fathom as far as purpose in their life, Father, that you have so much more in store for them. But that all starts with them giving their life to you. I pray that today, Father, if there's someone here who has not committed their life to you, that they just know deep in their heart how loved they are by you, that you knew them before they were even born and you have a plan and purpose for their life. They're not here by accident, Father, but we do pray that they give their life to you and live out their purpose. We thank you so much for all that you do. We thank you, Father, for, the, for that. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though we walk through difficult moments in our life, you are there with us. You've called us and we know we have a greater purpose. We love you so much. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.